The Great Hunger was a natural calamity which was made into an appalling disaster by a lack of concern on the part of a group of men who had acceded to control of the Westminster Parliament and whose lack of concern for human rights bordered on ethnic cleansing. Their selfish disregard for large-scale human suffering in the land that they had made part of their empire only 44 years earlier bears witness to their true regard for the Irish tenants, whom they allowed to sink to the brink of starvation even before the blight had struck. Their apathy toward the massive evictions of starving families and the millions of men, women, and children who starved to death or fell victims to preventable disease in a land that exported tons of food annually is difficult to condone. The number who died would be a significant measure of that horror, but that number eludes us. Different death tolls are cited by different sources, adding to the disinformation by implying a confusion about the actual facts. The truth is, the census of 1841 reported 8,175,000, while the census of 1851 recorded 6,552,000. Those not inclined to investigate further calculate a decrease of about 2 million and divide that into a million emigrants and a million starved. But that's not true. An in-depth look at the facts reveals that it would have been impossible to count the massive number of dispossessed tenants who wandered the roads or hid to avoid being registered for tithes and taxes, or to even determine how many were forced to immigrate since no records were kept of those who fled. Nor were there many records kept by greedy ship captains who packed more human cargo into their rat-infested vessels than they reported. There was also no account of the many who died in shipwrecks in the storm-tossed North Atlantic or who died on board from starvation and disease and were buried at sea, or indeed shortly thereafter in the lands to which they fled. No matter which course they chose to follow, survival was a matter of luck. The question then is how to estimate the scope of the disaster. Since births and deaths were not recorded until 1864, the census was the only written indication of population. But that's all it was, an indication. Because the census of 1841, which recorded 8,175,124, was too low. Census officials at that time argued millions hid from the census takers to avoid being registered for tithes and taxes and some census takers even refused to venture into the woods and the bogs to count the Irish. British historian Cecil Woodham Smith, in her book, The Great Hunger, wrote, owing to geographical difficulties and the unwillingness of the people to be registered, the census of 1841 gave a total smaller than the population in fact was. Officers engaged in relief work put the population as much as 25% higher. Landlords distributing relief were horrified when providing, as they imagined, for 60 persons to find more than 400 emerge. So much for 25%. That's conservative. In one district in County Clare, it was found to be 33% higher. Further, the 1841 census was an increase of 5.25% over the previous census, and the population continued growing at that rate until 1845, when the blight struck. Why wasn't that taken into consideration when death tolls were originally calculated? Among the new research on the hunger is a study published in the American Economic Review in 1994. It established that the annual birth rate during the Great Hunger had dropped from 5.25% to 1.4%. Therefore, if the population were 25% higher than stated in 1841 and still growing at the rate of 5.25% a year, the 1845 population would have been significantly higher than the 8.2 million noted in 1841. On the other hand, the post-hunger census of 1851 registered 6.5 million, and that was way too high, since not only did everyone register in the hope of receiving some relief but officials at that time complained family sizes were overstated and some even registered several times. Further, 
According to historian Christine Keneally, in her book, This Great Calamity, the tally of deceased were collected from surviving kin, but during the hunger, entire families disappeared through death or emigration. Hundreds of thousands of people died between 1841 and 1851 and left no relatives to report their deaths to the census takers. Professor Joel Macchier of Northwestern University and Cormac O'Grada of UCD in Dublin published a report in June 1999 that read in part, total famine mortality can be estimated by first projecting Irish population from 1841 to the eve of the famine in 1846. We then add the births that occurred in the famine years, subtract the estimated emigration and this yields a total, according to this report, of about two million dying in Ireland during those five years. Amartya Sen, the 1998 Nobel Prize laureate in economics, declared, I know of no other famine in the world in which the proportion of people killed was as large as the Irish famine in the 1840s. And some think that estimate of two million is low. Wolf Tones historian Brian Warfield wrote, based on a partial recount in 1841, the population could have been as high as 10.9 million. Allowing for natural increase, it would have reached approximately 11.8 million, leaving a loss of more than 5 million. That's quite a spread. 2 million in 5 years to more than 5 million in 10 years? Now, we recognize that any mortality figures are approximate, but we decided we would use the most recent estimates and most recent information to see if we could piece together a closer estimate. What we found? Absolutely incredible. By using the number recorded by the 1841 census and adding the 25% adjustment recommended by census officials at the time, we get an 1841 population of 10.2 million. Then, using the 5.25% birth rate quoted in the 1994 Economic Review and adding that to each year up to 1845, we get an 1845 population of more than 12.5 million. Carrying that on at the lower 1.4 percent birth rate to 1851, as suggested by Professors Mackier and Ograda in 1999, we get an 1851 population of at least 13.6 million. From that total, we subtract the 1851 census number of 6.5 million, even though we know that the 1851 census wasn't that high and we get a loss in population of more than 7 million in just 10 years. Now, if we subtract the estimated million who emigrated, and we pray that many did escape, although we're not counting the fatalities that they sustained, we're left with more than 6 million, gone to where there is no hunger. This is way more than earlier estimates. This can't all be due to the blight. What about the Devon Commission's report on Irish destitution before the blight ever struck? How many died as a result of that deprivation? Can it be that the total loss between 1841 and 1851 was really 6 million? If it was, how many died through normal attrition, as if there had been no blight? Just what was normal attrition? We went back to the report of the Census of Ireland for 1851 and found a table listing the deaths for each of the 10 years of the census by percentage of the total casualties. Using 6 million as the total casualties, we calculated the annual death tolls and these results are as close as available figures can ever get us to the actual number who perished. The pre-blight 1841 to 1845 death toll of 1.2 million indicates that a normal attrition was around 2.7%, which is not that far from that confirmed by Professor Macchier as 2.5%. Subtracting the deaths before 1845 from the deaths after 1845, we get a difference of at least 3.5 million due to other than normal attrition. Whether one considers the five-year total of 3.5 million as due to the hunger only 
or the 10-year total of 6 million due to the hunger and privation, it was an incredible mortality to occur less than 200 years ago in the world's richest and most civilized society. You can see why some have tried to minimize the magnitude of this tragedy and why we must share the moral of this story, its cautions and its warnings with others. Let's look again at that memorial stone in County Cork. This stone was erected near a mass grave at Lisnabini, one of the many towns that died during the Great Hunger and exist no more. It was erected based on the new evidence. Engraved on the stone in the dedication it says, only now is this truthful memorial permitted. May it be emulated at the hundreds of other Holocaust mass graves to commemorate the 5.2 million murdered martyrs and the other million who successfully fled. The scope of this disaster is finally being understood. Yet sadly there are still many who will say only a million died and a million emigrated. The saddest part is that we will never know the true number of how many or who perished. What we do know is the legacy of the Great Hunger, for it prompted the largest immigration in American history at a time when it was needed the most. When extra muscle, determination, and courage were needed to move this nation forward, the Irish were there to dig her canals, to lay the tracks for her intercontinental railroads, and to mine her natural resources. The timing was also fortunate, for when the nation was threatened with civil war, tens of thousands joined the ranks of the Army of the Potomac as totally Irish companies, regiments, and the legendary Irish Brigade, and they earned the praise of a grateful nation. In Ireland, however, the legacy was markedly different. For in addition to the incredible number of fatalities by one of the slowest and most painful of deaths, it altered the personality of the Irish for generations. After the great hunger, the Irish no longer married young. The humiliation of being unable to provide for one's family, coupled with the pain of burying one's children, must be partly responsible for that. For generations after the great hunger, the Irish, no matter how ill, could not be enticed to enter hospital, believing that one only went there to die. The unsanitary and overcrowded government hospitals and workhouses during the great hunger, which offered little more than the opportunity to contract disease, contributed to that distrust. The legendary hospitality of the Irish also fell victim to the great hunger when the destitute population still inclined to share what little they had realized that by inviting strangers into their homes they had exposed their own families to disease. The most enduring legacy, however, is the animosity that has prompted generations of exiled Irish to pool their resources toward freeing their native land. And no matter how we try to understand the nationalist sentiment of some Irish, we cannot hope to do so without an understanding of the great hunger. This remains the strongest legacy, since the other effects are finally beginning to fade. All these years after the great hunger, the Irish are beginning to marry young again. Today, Ireland has some of the finest hospitals and medical schools in Europe. And the hospitality of the Irish has made a comeback to the point where it is now one of the highlights of any visitor's stay. But the passion to free Ireland, which the English hoped would deteriorate with the demise and scattering of the Irish, found new strength with the freedom they found in other lands, and it returned to haunt the crown. It also put an end to the hunger. For the emigrant Irish in other lands sent record assistance back to those whom they were forced to leave behind, and thus it was the Irish themselves who concluded this pitiful chapter of their history. Now it is time to tell their story. We can no longer keep it buried. Although they won't discuss it, even the British now acknowledge that it happened. The British Prime Minister Tony Blair took a major step in soothing some of the lingering animosity. In an open letter, he acknowledged Britain's role in the famine. That was the first time that they had ever even admitted 
that it happened. That was significant. People said, hooray, the British have finally apologized. They did not apologize. They just acknowledged that it happened. These are only some of the facts about the great hunger, and we present them not to inflame emotions, nor to seek retribution, for the perpetrators are long gone. Instead, we present them first to inspire those who hear this to read, research, and relate to others this forgotten part of Ireland's and America's history and heritage. For the great hunger gave America the largest immigration in her history just when she needed it most. Secondly, we present it in the hope that the victims of that appalling tragedy be ever remembered. And we submit that the legacy that should be the most enduring is the memory of those who suffered for remembrance is our defense against it ever happening again. And finally, we offer it as a lesson to be vigilant in monitoring legislation to protect the human rights of any group or minority who suffers from unfair treatment or discrimination. For in the end, we are all God's children. Oh, Father dear, I often hear you speak of parents' eyes. Our lofty scenes and valleys green, our mountains rude and wild. They say it is a lovely land wherein a prince might dwell. Oh, why did you abandon? It, the reason to me tell Oh well do I remember That bleak December day The landlord and the sheriff came To drive us all away They searched my roof and fire away those cursed foreign spleen And that's another reason That I left for skip 